So this is my experience of racing in the Himalayas. And without doubt, this is my craziest race story that I've ever had and the closest I've ever been to death. And it was 2013. I've just finished a project in Southeast Asia. I was working sort of between Indonesia and Kuala Lumpur and you're working in the oil industry, headhunting people to, to work for the big companies in, the, in those twin towers. And the project hadn't gone great and hadn't ended well. And I was kind of, if I look back, I was sort of on a soul searching mission. And you know, I've had those when I've been cycle touring in Asia. This became the perfect experience for that. And my view was I need, I just need to get out, I need to go and just sort of get into my head again and figure out the answers. And so I got on a flight from Kuala Lumpur, landed in Kathmandu, never been to Nepal before, but my view was, or my thoughts were, my plans, et cetera, were to just go to, towards Everest and hike that way and see some beautiful things. And hopefully the answers will come. And they inevitably always come when you're out there on your own. And that's, it can give you anything. If everybody's looking for a superpower, the superpower, the only superpowers that I know of are being able to be alone for long periods of time so you can really think with clarity. And number two, not caring one bit what people think about you. Those are the two closest things to superpowers. But I got to Kathmandu, never been there before. I landed, I remember landing, and they literally give you the option to have a 30-day visa or a 100-day visa. And there wasn't much difference in cost between the two. And I've had to deal with immigration in Southeast Asia before when you kind of overstay somewhere and it's... It's, it's bureaucracy and it's boring and it's gonna be costly. So I just opted for the 100 day visa and I didn't know at the time, but that was to give me lots more freedom to do lots more adventure. And I got to Kathmandu. It was not, it was levels above the craziness of Southeast Asia. What usually happens is somebody goes to Bangkok, they land in Bangkok and think, whoa, this is crazy compared to Europe. And then you'll go to somewhere like Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and that's even, even crazier, and it makes Bangkok look organized. And then you'll go to somewhere like Jakarta eventually, and then that makes everything look nuts. When I got to Kathmandu, it was like going back 250 years, like walking through Kathmandu, even in the center, which is sort of tourist friendly, there's cows, there's chickens walking around, there's people selling fruit, fruit on the floor, and you know, North Face knockoff gear you can find everywhere. And it's kind of this mixed melting pot of cultures and, and experiences and the food's fantastic. You're definitely gonna get food poisoning, but it's great. And you meet lots of people that are either going climbing or running or hiking or walking or, you know, and it's so, it's, it's such a, a fresh place to be and get excited about. And after about two, three days, I ended up, instead of going to Everest, I wanted first to go to, I decided I'm gonna spend a lot more time here. I really, really enjoy it. And so I'm gonna go to Annapurna first, which is on the other side, which is on the west. And so I had the choice between spending $60 on a plane ride that would have taken 35 minutes to get to Bukhara, which is a beautiful city on the edge of a lake, or take, take a $5 bus seven hours to get to Bukhara. And so I opted for the cheaper. I was kind of thinking, oh, I'll save some money and you know, it'll be an adventure. I get in this bus and it's made for 12 people. It fits, we fit 18 people in the back and there's makeshift seats and all the luggage is packed on the top. So the weight distribution is not working out. And I get talking to a couple of Nepalese and this is completely normal for them. And we, the guy who's driving the bus is 18 years old and he's racing a friend of his who set off at the same time from Kathmandu and they're trying to race and they're trying to take it over each other. You look to your right and I was at the right side of the bus and it's just sheer drops for 2,000, 3,000 meters. And it's absolutely insane. You kind of like look away, it's that frightening. Um, and anyway, I get, to, I get to Bukhara and it's night. So I check into a hotel, hostel, Next day, it's absolutely beautiful. I watch the sunrise and there's people paragliding and I go to find a, I go to find a more longer stay hotel. And I find this incredibly weird and wonderful round house on top of a hotel that's overlooking the paragliders landing. And amazing sunrises, amazing sunset. It was just perfect. And to the back of me was the Annapurnas. So you, you can see Fishtail Mountain, you can see the Annapurnas and it's just, it feels as if you can reach out and touch it. And so I started to just go into the Annapurnas. You get a $40 permit at the time to go into the Annapurna conservation area. Just started to walk into the Annapurnas and you can go for three days, you can go for 10 days, you can go for 20 days. You can go as far as you want and you can be out there for months. And the longest I was out there was just under 30 days. And I'm just hiking around and I'm kind of like in my own head, I'm trying to problem solve, I'm thinking about the path, the way forward. And it becomes very, very clear. And the answer that I came to was 
you've got to get your hat in the right. Like at that point, I'd become a decent runner, but I still had this thing about me that I still wanted to be in my career. I still needed to earn money. I still need to save up money. And I still need to have a big lot of cash in order to back myself to have, um, to be able to turn this into a professional gig. And what I learned on that trip was exactly that. In order to, you, you're kind of doing exactly what you love, which is great, big tick in the box, but you're not giving it the attention it deserves. And so what I learned from that trip is very quickly, I've got to get in somewhere, make as much money as I can, live like a monk, and then go at it and give myself a year where I don't have to worry about bills, about utilities, about all the things that you get and have to pay for. I can just focus on my running and recovery. That's essentially what I did afterwards. But I got down from this big hike and I hadn't been doing much running, I'd just been hiking and got down from this hike and I was reading a book on the first ascent of Annapurna by Moritz Herzog, uh, a French climber with his team. It had been a disaster, but they, you know, they were the first team to scale it. I was reading this book and I heard this Australian uh, accent. This girl said, hey, are you doing a race, mate? And this was on the first day. And I was like, what, what race and how did you know I was running? She checked my uh, running shoes. I think I had a pair of ASICS trail running shoes that I was doing the hiking in. And then she showed me a race, the Annapurna 100 that's happening on Saturday. And so the next day was kind of signing. So I, I went there after speaking to her and it was kind of like, okay, this has come to me. I cannot believe there's, a, there's an ultra race here. And this is all I've been obsessed with the last three years. I managed to persuade the guy, it was a $3,000 package deal, but I managed to persuade this race director that I'd just give him a couple of hundred dollars. And for him, he really didn't care. It was just another runner running. There's a hundred expats who paid the 3,000 package deal. And there's a hundred Nepalese runners. And you know, they're super strong. And so I found out that Lizzie Hawker was doing the race as well. And my race plan for the next day was just stick with Lizzie Hawker for as long as you can. You'll learn loads of stuff. And she was an expert in it. She still holds a lot of records, but she was an expert in the trails at the time. So I had an afternoon to find like my nutrition, how to carry stuff. And everybody had all the kit and the kit was like nuts. The kit was like war and peace. And I thought, I don't need a, it's starting at seven o'clock in the morning, the race, it's hundred K. I don't need a, I don't need a torch. I don't need a jacket. It's like really nice at the moment. I think it was March or April. I don't need, I don't need a jacket. And I just, instead of gels, which I couldn't find any, anywhere, I just had lots of candy bars, stuffed those in a little bum bag. And um, I, for the map, I had it on the back of a Strepsils. I'll try and find this, but it might be difficult. But on the back of a Strepsils box, I'd written the checkpoints. So that was literally my map. Seven kilometers in order to get to the next checkpoint, 13 kilometers to the next checkpoint. And that was my map. And it was in a plastic bag to make sure that it was waterproof from sweat, not really in the rain, because it was such a nice weather at the time. So the day after the itinerary was, we're gonna have breakfast at six o'clock in the morning and then the race starts at seven o'clock in the morning. And I met this guy, this brilliant guy, Lal, Indian. And we were having a great time and we said, okay, we'll finish the race. He was doing the 70K race and then, and then we'll, have a, we'll have some whiskey afterwards or rum and, and uh, you know, it's gonna be brilliant. And we were kind of in that sort of mood and, and we were in the same camp and there was three different camps and got ready the next day. We got up and we were super excited and it was like six o'clock, nobody's around. And the word that we got was breakfast has been postponed one hour. And so the race is postponed one hour as well. So seven o'clock breakfast, eight o'clock start of the race. We, we started to get hungry. So we, we went into the kitchen and we started to make porridge. I had some porridge on me. And then, and then the, we just had a gun go and literally 200 people minus the 15 people in our camp just run past. So we quickly got ready and a, motor, a, police, a police or a security motorbike or something sort of led us the start of the race and we're kind of late, but you know, it's all good. And we just, it's gonna, we're gonna be out there for, you know, eight hours, probably I was, I, I was imagining it's gonna take eight or nine hours. Um, and the motorbike took us the wrong way. And then it took us, I think 15 kilometers to catch up to the first runners. So we'd obviously gone, taken time, but then gone off the, so I never caught up to Lizzie Hawker. And I just kept moving through the field. And the real story starts at 66 kilometers. And it's literally, you're in the Himalayas. So you're going up and down and it's crazy. It's crazy on the quads, it's crazy on hamstrings. But I'd been well conditioned by just hiking, literally just hiking. So sometimes that can be your base fitness in order to be, I'm pretty specific because you're on, I was on exactly the same terrain that I'd been hiking on. And you know, it's steep and you're going down steps sometimes like rock hard concrete slabs of uh, steps that have been there for hundreds of years. And that was the perfect conditioning. And so, you know, I was just moving slowly over the ground, but moving forward and passing people. At 66 kilometers, I realized why the safety pack was, was, was war on peace, the safe, safety list. Because the heavens opened and it started to rain hard, but ice cold Himalayan rain. 
And I thought, oh, okay, this is, I, the first thought I had was, this is really nice and refreshing because I'm hot, 66K, only 34th K. Today. Oh, brilliant, I'm on time, I'm gonna finish before dark, it's gonna be great, should get on the podium, all that kind of, all those kind of feelings. And then it just got worse and heavier and worse. And then that was the first of three major storms. And at the 70, 75K mark, there was switchbacks. I didn't know how long, I hadn't really studied the mark. All I knew about was the checkpoints. So I got, to, I got to a checkpoint somewhere around the start of the hill. And it was like 25K up, or something like, something like 15, 20K up, and then flat, and then down, and then up. And all along that up, I didn't realize that I was just taking it super low. I'm going uphill, I'm power walking when I can. It's up a road. The Nepalese people have just gone. The Nepalese runners have just gone directly up. So they've taken the shortcut because they know that the next checkpoint is near the top of the hill. And so I checked in with the next checkpoint. It was like loads of people had apparently passed me. I didn't know what was going on. And, you know, I'm second foreigner or something like that. And, or first foreigner, you know. And, and then another storm happened. I picked up some biscuits, more, thing, more, more energy in order to kind of like move forward. And then my water bottle that I was just carrying, a plastic water bottle the entire time. It was another storm and it started to get towards dark. And I thought I had to slow down because I'm going up and down treacherous mountains. I had no light no jacket, and I'm just there in a race, like a running vest and small shorts, which I always run in, and like these trail running shoes, and I'm just kind of like trying to move forward, just happy that I can, I'm on a road and sometimes a car will you know, pass and I can see from the lights. And then it just got heavier and heavier and heavier, and it got it at its worst in the last 7K. So I thought I'd done, I, I was wearing a Casio watch, I wasn't wearing a GPS or anything like that, and I thought I'd done 93K, and we had 7K to the finish, and I thought, great, this is gonna be a power hike, or, or, you know, I'm running slow, but it's gonna take me two hours. And I thought, okay, at least it's one track. And I've done this track in the bus on the day before getting to the camp, and that's all I'm gonna do. This track, because of all the rain water, had turned into a river. And so I'm hiking up, I cannot see a thing. There's no moonlight, it's cloudy. And whenever there is sort of the moonlight, I kind of can see ahead and just see how bad it is. The rocks are coming down at me, hitting me in the shins. So I'm constantly getting bruised on bruises. And I'm hiking up this, which eventually takes me three hours. So I think I finished in something like 13 hours in the end, which is insane for, for 100K, even given the up and down, the elevation gain. And I, there was times when a, a, this Jeep came around the corner and I thought he was just there to save people in the race, but he was just trying to get down. And he just highlighted this gap in the road that kind of the road had fallen away. And I was so lucky that it was the timing was right. And I just went round it. And then eventually I got to the camp and there was just Ekamai and Lal waiting. And they were giving me food and they were like, oh, I can't believe what's going on. And I was like, I think people are gonna be dying out there. Like it was really, really, really bad. And, um, and I was worried for people's safety. And there was times then and after, afterwards that people have died in these races because they haven't been well equipped like me, but I wasn't well prepared. And so it was a really good lesson in terms of worst, even if it's the brightest day and you think it's gonna be perfect, you never know what's gonna happen in the race. And so you've got to be well prepared and that safety list is there for a place. Sometimes it's overkill because of insurances, but I had to be prepared. And if I would have been prepared, it would have been a hell of much more, much more enjoyable experience. But <laughs> I remember the next day, Lizzie Hawkey was furious because of the lack of support. And the fun part about it is, once I got to that, that checkpoint and they said, okay, I think you're first or second foreigner or whatever, there's loads of, shit, there's loads of Nepalese guys in front of you. I thought, okay, great, like push forward. Now you're feeling strong and push forward. Now it's flat and then it's a downhill and it's up, go for it. And everyone, because of the storms, everybody, all the volunteers, which volunteers make races, they'd all gone home once they figured out that it was a storm. And so when you wanted to get to a checkpoint and get underneath and try and get warm and try and have maybe a hot tea or something like that, a hot soup, and maybe take somebody's jacket if they can, nobody was there. And so you didn't get checked off. None of, nobody was getting checked on, on the checkpoint and, and then you just had to get to the finish. And I remember at one point when I was going up hill, just power hiking uphill, I couldn't see anything because it was so dark. And I was so exhausted. And I just thought if I just sleep here, and just wait, just to have a power nap for 20 minutes, I'll feel so much better. And maybe somebody will come and maybe I can kind of jog in with somebody. That would have ki literally killed me. And there's so many stories like that up high and you kind of read about them. Mountaineers just thinking, I'll just have a rest here and that's it, game over. As soon as your brain starts playing tricks on you, and that's the reason for the safety list, because you can physically be able to move over the ground, but once your brain gives in or your mind is just, just gone because of the lack of carbohydrate, which definitely happened to me, 
But I'd done all that preparation. I'd been preparing for nearly three months before, going up and down in the Himalayas, perfect terrain. It was probably one of the best prepared without doing so much running. And so, what's the moral of the story? I mean, for me, it was, it was if you're going to get involved in serious trail races like that, you've got to be prepared and you've got to have the lightest stuff. And so you, get, you have to take your kit seriously. You've got to take nutrition really seriously and you've got to make sure that you're not relying on anybody else, whether that's a friend who's meant to be at a drink station for you, giving you your, your sports drink or whether it's you know, somebody giving you gels or whatever, that cannot be your plan. You've got to have your backup plan. So if that means carrying a few extra grams or extra kilograms even, doesn't matter. So long as you can move forward slowly, that's great. And if you need that security blanket, that, that safety blanket, what was it weigh? 10 grams? And it literally could save your life and also make you visible. I was invisible in the Himalayas on my own without a torch and didn't have, I didn't have a, a, a solution to how am I going to get to the finish line. With about 5k, 3k to go even, I could have, I literally could have died and it would have been hyperthermia, rushed to hospital, where's nearest hospital, in Kathmandu, not in Pokhara, and so all these things, eventually I got to the finish line, so it happened and it was all right, but I could see that the, the situation and the, the state that people were in the next day, some people had it way worse than me and they were finishing double the time and still finishing in the morning when I was waking up and having breakfast, so what can I, what can I say? I mean, <laughs> I hope you got something from that. If you did, and if you're getting something from these videos, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And if you've got any questions about racing, whether it's out there in the trails, get into the Himalayas, get into Kathmandu and the logistics behind it, let me know in the comments below and I'll help you out.